Hi, my name is Eric Johnson. I am a veterinarian down in Marietta, Georgia. I'm doing a series of videos on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel and I've put together some videos uh, of me talking in the car. I've done some green screen and uh, some topics. I hope you've had a chance to look at those. I also have a 20 step solution for fish disease cases so that if you were to try to get in touch with me and figure out what's wrong with your fish, I decided to put together a 20 step uh, process and that's in my YouTube channel as well. This presentation is the first of hopefully many where I take presentations that I've made in the past and make them available in a spoken format. And I think this is going to be particularly valuable if you get a pen and paper to jot down what you're seeing and what you're hearing. And the reason being is I don't read my slides because that is boring. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just using the slides as a cue card of what to talk about and uh, you can read them as we go along. And it might be if I want to flesh something out a little bit more, I might insert a uh, another slide on top of that. Video um, presentation uh, is done in PowerPoint and it is uh, control of parasites. It's pretty much what, what this one's about. And it talks about parasites in uh, kind of general terms, but then we drill down into specific kinds of parasites. Uh, we'll talk about the ciliates, and we'll talk about flukes and we'll talk about parasites that you can see with the naked eye and actually that is the three kinds of parasites that there are and what I like about breaking them into those three groups is it's easier to get your head around them um, in a nutshell the flukes are a simple story there's uh, two or three medications that work very well on flukes uh, the differences in the management of flukes has to do with whether you're treating systems with plants or ponds that are huge or ponds that are small or fish tanks in the house and certain spe uh, sensitive species of fish. For example, you can't use superverm with goldfish. All right, you probably wouldn't anyway because uh, nowadays Pratsyquantel is better for flukes. Um, right now, Mardell clout is being used for a lot of things, and I'm having great luck with it. Uh, as far as having actually gone through with a microscope and proven that flukes clear with clout, um, I haven't done that yet, but I am sure I have a video on clout in my channel, and that will always be update, uh, up to date regarding clout and or what parasites it treats. I have found it very successful with the ciliates. That's a category of parasites we'll be talking about. The ciliated protozoan parasites are so named because their bodies are, uh, if you want to call them a body, the, these organisms are covered in tiny hairs. And these hairs, or cilia, are what the, uh, these organisms use to move around. And the um, category of ciliates is pretty full of uh, parasites except that what you're gonna see on tropical fish and pond fish and koi and goldfish Siamese fighting fish are a small group of ciliates probably the most deadly in fact I'm gonna tell you the parasites most deadly to uh, least deadly in the ciliate class the most deadly ciliated protozoan parasite uh, both quick kill and uh, chronicity and difficulty to diagnose and perhaps even one of the hardest to treat is Costia. The second hardest killer among the ciliates is Chelodinella. And you might notice I haven't said ick yet because white spot disease announces itself and it doesn't kill fish right off the bat in large groups. You start seeing white spots, the fish get weaker and weaker and, and ostensibly you treat that with clout actually jot that down um, salt also works in elevating the temperature but there are so many videos on ick that I've already made let's get back to it the uh, ciliated protozoan parasites uh, are composed of costia chelodinella um, the uh, third most common uh, or most deadly killer would be ick 
and the fourth I mean it's a killer but it's really not that big of a killer is Trichodina if Trichodina did anything it is that it causes the fish to flash and scrape and then that can cause the uh, scratched areas to go into uh, bacterial ulcers uh, Trichodina along with most of the ciliated protozoan parasites are stressful so we're going to cover ick first that's white spot disease and we're going to cover it uh, in the highlights now i have a video in my channel of what these parasites look like under the microscope and um, uh, that's what they look like under the microscope basically just a ball covered with cilia and and here's the thing a u-shaped macronucleus inside i know you knew that okay i'm not trying to insult your intelligence but uh, when you're looking at parasites at first, you're going to see all these damn round parasites, like, uh, you know, Trichodina is round, and Chilodinella is sort of round, and uh, when you see that U-shaped nucleus in it, you should know right off the bat that's white spot. Can't be anything else, okay? So the white spot um, disease, as we've uh, talked about in other videos, uh, depends on stress and cooler water. Ick has a hard time living in 78 degrees. The life cycle's so fast, and, and here's the reason that warm water has a tendency to, to wear out Ick is because these, um, the Ick has two life cycles. Uh, there's a life cycle that is buried under the skin on the fish, and then there's a little uh, packet of baby Icks that goes to the bottom of the tank or pond. And there's this one phase right in the middle, boys and girls, um, where the packet on the bottom bursts open and uh, organisms called swarmers come out. I had probably trophozoites or some crazy name. Anyway, these swarmers come out of the packets on the bottom. Well, they've got to find food pronto. And if the water's warm, they have to find food pronto -er, or more prontoly. And the um, swarmers in warm water have a problem attacking the fish which are uh, healthier in warm water and getting to the fish in sufficient numbers to really pose much of a problem so they basically just spend their energy in warm water cold water facilitates the swarmers uh, slows their metabolism down the fish's metabolism down allows the swarmers to get the upper hand and so you see white spot so uh, knowing this you know that warming the uh, parasite up. I like 78 degrees, but uh, everybody differs. I'm clearing uh, ick these days with uh, salt. Works fine. If you're worried about dosing or having chemicals around, you can use salt. Uh, and Mardell clout. I uh, just recently actually used clout in a 360 gallon tank that I didn't want to salt. One of the problems with salt, and uh, again, I hope you have a pen and paper handy. Um, one of the problems with salt is you got to get rid of that water once the salt treatment is done, and salt is great, uh, but salt's hard on live plants, and you have to get rid of that salty water. And really, in 360 gallons, you're using a pretty good bit of salt. Uh, I think something on the order of 10 to 12 pounds of salt. And uh, But don't quote me on that in this particular video. Well, um, got ahead of myself. Actually, this slide talks about ick treatments, and it mentions salt. Um, there is a form of this parasite that is under the skin, and there's another form that's down on the bottom in a packet, right? Well, the only place you can kill the swarm, uh, the ick, is in the swarmer form, and salt waits. Salt waits to catch the parasite in the swarmer form, and that's the nice thing about it is it's there all the time. You don't have to be dosing medicine that particular moment that a swarmer comes out. Swarmer comes out of the packet, tries to swim up, hits the salt, and crenates, and that's it. Uh, salt is great. I prefer, honestly, Mardell clout. Um, Uh, the next parasite that I wanted to talk about is a uh, one called Trichodina. Uh, that parasite under the microscope is a flying saucer, 
and inside that flying saucer is a, a couple of rings concentric rings of believe it or not teeth and the edge of the trichodina has cilia that's how it motiv um, motors around and then the uh, teeth inside the organism scratch away at the surface of the fish um, loosening up mucus and other cells and the trichodina consumes those and therein lies the problem uh, the trichodina is very irritating to the skin causes the fish to flash and scratch and all that that's that's what gets infected Trichodina is cleared, oh, 90% of the time with uh, salt. And trichodina is cleared very easily with formalin and malachite green combinations. And trichodina really um, could almost be cleaned out of your fish collection uh, just with clean water. This is especially true in ponds. Uh, trichodina kind of sort of depends on uh, leaf litter, mud, dirt unclean environments um, and uh, stale water high levels of background pollution for trichodina to kind of get the upper hand but uh, almost everything works on trichodina salt if you don't have plants in smaller facilities formalin malachite if you have larger facilities and the water's not too warm uh, Mardell clout clears it uh, assuming the facility is a thousand gallons or less because over a thousand gallons Mardell is kind of expensive to treat it the way you would need to for uh, trichodina. Next parasite I want to talk about uh, next parasite I want to talk about is Costia. Costia is a small parasite Costia is a small parasite uh, you will see it under higher magnification, something on the order of uh, 150 to 200, you'll make it out. And then some of these videos show it at 400 power. Uh, you don't need that to diagnose it. What you're going to look for is silvery little commas, and they're swarming. And uh, pretty easy to recognize. Probably the most effective treatment for that would be something like clout. And uh, formalin malachite also works pretty well with it. One of the things that's interesting about this particular ciliated protozoan parasite is costia can dry on stuff. So let's say you had a tank full of costia and say you had driftwood, you remove the driftwood to treat the tank and uh, the, the driftwood dries out. So you're pretty sure that you don't have a disease organism going back in. and you put the driftwood back in there and lo and behold you have costi again there's the reason it dried and uh, so you know sometimes it's smart to leave ornaments in and uh, treat the entire system uh, and clear the costia that way costia is a big time killer ice water in the spring uh, rapid mortalities it has a tendency to insist uh, it has this little um, has a way of attaching to a cell on the gills and it'll each cell it attaches to it kills that cell and and uh, if you saw the video that popped up and I'm sorry about the audio on that um, you can see that those organisms occur in the, in the hundreds if not thousands so they're taxing the gills pretty hard and that's why those fish die so so hard in the spring We talked a little bit about treatments for costia. Um, this slide reminds me of one though. Uh, formalin malachite is pretty effective at that and you can use formalin malachite to clear costia because costia doesn't tend to hide in or on the fish. So let's just say that you wanted to nail costia before it got into your quarantine or your tank. You could treat with formalin malachite in a plastic bag under oxygen or well aerated tub, um, any of a variety of uh, containers, just uh, don't deprive them of oxygen, the fish. Uh, put formalin malachite in there, uh, something on the order of 25 to 50 parts per million. I um, think that works out to one cc per 10 gallons of water would be the appropriate dose uh, in a, say, five gallon bucket with an aerator, assuming the fish are smaller. If it's a big koi, then you probably need to put it into a vat. Um, and the two-hour treatment probably isn't 
very effective. But uh, two hours in Formalin Malachite will clear Costia on incoming fish. I like that method. And uh, outside of that, in ponds, fish tanks, etc., if you want to get ahead of Costia, uh, that's going to be Mardell Clout and formalin malachite green. Now there are other treatments, potassium permanganate, chloramine T, and copper all have a tendency to work on costia. I don't like copper in fresh water. Uh, copper can be under quite a few circumstances, very unstable and result in copper toxicity. Um, Seachem manufactured, if they don't still, um, a chelated or aminated copper. It's a uh, copper that's complexed with a protein, believe it or not, and uh, cupramine is the name of the product. And it goes into the water and the uh, protein, the aminated component of copper comes off at a very predictable rate and it leaks copper ions into the system which clears the parasite very effectively. I, I, I like cupramine, but there's other ways to do it. <clears throat> Salt is very gentle. Formalin malachite green, uh, maybe not as gentle, consumes oxygen in the uh, in the warmer water, and then uh, but then clout and uh, is is a very elegant solution. So this is Kiladinella. It is uh, shaped like a man's ear. Is how I get people to recognize it. In, uh, sorry, I have audio with these videos. Um, Kiladinella is an ear shaped parasite and it has a tendency to spin around like you nailed the end of it to the floor. There are other videos, uh, in fact, in my YouTube channel, I've got a uh, video of all the parasites under the microscope, which are much more detailed videos. Um, of these different parasites, longer videos, for you to compare. If you're using a microscope and looking at the microscope video, then you can switch over to this one and actually look at these parasites under the microscope. And this one is just a survey of Kiladinella, Costiaic, etc. And Kiladinella is uh, it's a hard killer. Comes up in the spring. Actually, it can work any time of the year, and especially in, in uh, fish tanks. Uh, at 78 degrees, it's it's pretty happy. Uh, fortunately, Kiladinella is one of the easier ones to kill. Uh, salt works uh, really, really well, and um, Mardell Clout kills it. And I know you're probably tired of hearing about that, but looking for, at something that is safe for neon tetras and ram cichlids and Raphael cats and Brocus britsky, okay, and life, uh, well, I think I said life plants. It doesn't kill your beneficial bacteria, it's easy to use, it's inexpensive, minimal staining. Uh, that's clout. And that's the reason I'm, I'm mentioning it kind of a lot. Uh, interesting thing on garlic. Uh, not so much lately. Uh, seeing a few parasites surviving it. Seems to improve the overall health of the fish, but doesn't actually clear uh, at least uh, two of the parasites, flukes and ick. So, um, leaving the ciliated protozoan parasites. That category of parasites. We're going to talk briefly about potassium permanganate because potassium permanganate has a good spectrum against the ciliates and kind of a side benefit controlling bacterial infections in very large ponds. This slide, and you might pause the video for this data, this data is correct for using potassium permanganate in ponds. Um, trying to get four to six parts per million potassium permanganate. It's hard to do that in small fish tanks unless you're very experienced and very careful, in which case you treat with potassium permanganate to color. You kind of get used to the color that it is and you apply it uh, very gradually. It's just so easy to overdose. I would like you to be very cautious uh, or not use it at all. How about that? Um, but potassium permanganate in facilities that are so big that using uh, you know even a gallon of formalin malachite isn't enough to treat these huge facilities then potassium permanganate based on the fact that it is very inexpensive would be one for you to look at in that regard now as potassium permanganate goes um, it is um, to look at it it's kind of a dark dark purple powder and you put it in the water it turns the water pink while it's active you can see in the upper picture you can see that Jinrin platinum ogon uh, with the purple water over its back. That's an active treatment and 
Once the potassium permanganate has spent the energy it's got on the parasites, then it turns to an amber or tea color. Make a note of this. If you treat with potassium permanganate and the water turns brown cloudy, uh, you got a major water change to do. The fish do not thrive in brown cloudy water. And usually that means there is an overabundance of organic material. In other words, the pond started or the tank started out way too dirty for that first potassium permanganate treatment. Probably should have cleaned the tank out. But you're going to do that now. If the water's brown cloudy, you've got a major water change to do. Here's a ciliated parasite. Um, God, you don't see this one very much. When I do, I'm kind of like whoever's with me. I go, oh, hey, look, come on over. It's epistylus. Pretty easy to recognize. It's um, basically goblet shaped. It has a long neck on it, a ciliated rim uh, around the top of the wine goblet. It's um, often mistaken for fungus. In fact, when you see cotton growths on the fish, mouth, fins, body, etc., um, you never really know whether it's fungus or columnaris bacteria or uh, epistylus. And so kind of knowing what it looks like under the microscope is sort of a thing um, because you might see this. And then, you know, you have a ciliate, which is super easy to clear up with salt or clout or formalin or pretty much just about anything gets rid of it. Um, chloramine tea which is in Jungle Lifeguard. Um, hope you wrote that down. Um, and then you wouldn't have to embark on treatments for bacteria or fungus if, you, if you're looking at it and you can see it's epistylus, you see. So sometimes using a microscope under those circumstances is extremely useful. So, <coughs> ostensibly we have covered the first, and this is the major category of parasites, that's the ciliates. Now we're going to talk very briefly about parasites you can see with the naked eye. It's a group of three parasites, anchor worm, fish lice, and er, er, uh, I think it's ergastulus, uh, gill maggots. I've seen one case ever, ever. Um, guys that work over at the fisheries and are looking at catfish all day long and certain other fish, uh, fisheries and places see gill maggots all the time. I think I have a picture of some gill maggots. But anchor worm we see a lot. Um, there's a picture on this particular slide of a white fish with anchor worms on it. Um, they embed, somehow they know, to embed ventrally and uh, hide behind the fins. You see these little red dots coming up and if you look real close there's these little glassy green colored y-shaped worm sticking out from under the scales uh, you can pick them off if you want but that's a pain uh, most of what you need is like an insect growth regulator um, there's a compound you can usually find if you keyword search it on the internet called express idi uh, that's in the koi vet pages as well koivet.com slash resources and um, i might even have a link to it on this video description underneath i don't know um, but Express IDI is an insect growth regulator that works. Program, which are tablets for dogs, um, also work. That's uh, active ingredient is lufenurone. And then there's a microbe lift compound that has the insect growth regulator in it that works very, very well too. Uh, the active in some of these is dimelin. You can also search for that. Um, sometimes it's hard to track that down, but the dosing on that is very low. And if you overdosed it by 10 times, it wouldn't matter to the fish. It is very, very safe. And I think I might have got ahead. So there's the anchor worm. One of the things I wanted to mention about anchor worm, uh, besides telling you that you don't really have to pull them off, when the dimelin kills them, they just kind of fall off or rot away or whatever, doesn't matter. I think when people pull off the anchor worm, they're actually creating more stress by handling the fish uh, than they would if they just let the fish shed the anchor worm as the worms die. Uh, the other thing I want to mention about anchor worm is that anchor worm will chew on the fish and cause flashing, scratching, and that sort of thing for kind of a while before it shows up as the worm. There are, I guess, uh, from memory, seven larval forms, I guess, as it's uh, molting through in a free swimming version until before it even attaches uh, and becomes the worm. 
uh, the worm is actually a female uh, organism. So you got your males and your babies all swimming around biting the fish, causing them to flash and scrape and get red and hacked off, clamp their fins. And then after uh, three to seven days of that, all of a sudden these worms show up and you're like, oh man, that's the reason that they were scratching for the last so-and-so days. Learning a control, that's anchor worm control, is again an insect growth regulator. They used to have anchors away, don't know if they still do, I haven't found it lately. But um, you'll see, uh, well that mentions Express IDI, that's still out there. And then Microbe Lift came out with a, a uh, Larvidex compound, which is an insect growth regulator as well. So Argulus, um, here we go with some weird audio. The uh, Argulus is a uh, disc shaped green ish colored parasite they're attached to the surface of fish uh, goldfish maybe not so much on mollies because mollies are small and uh, fish lice are kind of big although I did see a fish louse eating a guppy or at least parasitizing a guppy not the most common thing most of the time what happens is a client will call you up and tell you that their fish has uh, unusual freckles and you'll talk about shimi and a couple other things, but then they'll call you back and say, oh, by the way, the freckles have moved to other places on the fish. As soon as you hear that, you know that it's fish lice. Uh, fish lice is nice because it's also treated with an insect growth regulator like Express IDI or Dimelin. Clears nicely, very quickly, um, three, four days, something like that. Ergasilis, basically the same thing. It's a parasite you can see with the naked eye. It's a crustacean parasite. It has to go through some molt cycles before it attacks the gills. And when you see it, all you have to do is put the insect growth regulator in it. It can't molt anymore, can't reproduce, dies, falls off. We're on to the last category of parasites. Um, and that is the trematode parasites. And this section is actually fairly easy as well. Um, because um, flukes now respond well I say flukes now respond they would always have responded but there's new medicines on the market that make clearing the flukes so easy uh, in smaller facilities that it, it uh, it's almost a non sequitur probably in facilities under a thousand gallons uh, and any of you with fish tanks etc planted or not and I'm not talking to you saltwater people about this because I'm not sure about Protiquantil and saltwater tanks most especially with invertebrates and uh, corals but in freshwater there's a compound called Protiquantil and it's available in bottles uh, I think Hikari has one called Protzi Pro um, generally with this particular compound you're gonna see Protzi in the name that's P-R-A-Z-I Quantal, and your veterinarian uh, also has well maybe has some Dronset tablets that's pure Quantal. the problem is is that uh, Quantal in the Dronset or veterinary form is outrageously expensive I think I did the math on it one time and it would have uh, back then it would have cost $300 to treat a 10 gallon tank but now these importers um, that make things like Protzi Pro, et cetera, are bringing it in in 55 gallon drums has brought the price down considerably, which is good. Uh, Protzi Quanta, like I said, has no effect on the uh, fish or plants or biological filter. It also has no effect on ick or any of the ciliates either. It is a specific treatment for flukes and it works amazing. Um, one thing I'd like you to know about flukes is it's the primary mode of transmission for um, for ulcer disease in koi. Um, almost always, when you see um, when you see uh, ulcers, you're going to see flukes associated with that. And this picture is fabulous because what you can see this is the base of a fluke. This is basically his foot, and you can see a ring of little um, um, teeth they're not they're actually vicious toenails around the center which has two uh, j-shaped hooks and those j-shaped hooks are anchors basically the fluke will use his suckers on his head and his little razor toenails to move around on the fish once he finds a place he's happy he'll dig those two hooks down into the skin nice and deep uh, 
and then the fish can't dislodge them or at least you can't dislodge them easily and uh, where those two hooks go down into the skin is where the ulcer will start uh, in the skin because it's a deep break in the skin and the fish are under stress with the flukes and if it's in springtime or high crowding situations it can be just about explosive fluke control we used to have fluke tabs don't know if we still do they were just okay um, uh, kind of expensive and uh, they were made in England and they used to send over just however many they felt like sending over so sometimes halfway through the season they would be gone and so re recommending them was um, hit or miss because you might be recommending them in June and there aren't any left in the United States uh, Mardell clout has come along and um, testing um, whether or not the flukes die with Mardell clout I'm 99% sure that they will based on the way clout actually works but I'm not going to stick my neck out right here especially with a medicine called Praziquanta working as well as it is so uh, if you think you have flukes I'm going to suggest that you would reach for in all probability either clout or Praziquanta which by the way you can use together because they work two different ways and are not metabolized by the fish they are uh, very effective topically if you had a microscope you wouldn't have to guess if you had a microscope this is a not a hard parasite to recognize because it's a stretchy worm uh, versus any of the other parasites and if you did a, a skin scrape biopsy and you'll be able to find a video in my channel of how to do that if you did a skin scrape biopsy you'd be able to tell what the parasite actually was before you had to do a shotgun treatment Flute control on goldfish, again, very, very simple. It used to have superverm. We don't want to use that on goldfish. Um, superverm is getting harder and harder to get with the advent of Praziquantel. Again, goldfish, get with Praziquantel. It's The only problem with it is it's not effective financially in facilities over two or 3,000 gallons. and ponds uh, you can use other compounds um, flukes will be controlled with uh, cereal application uh, formalin malachite green uh, takes a little bit more formalin than uh, most of the published doses so um, you kind of have to make it up as you go along and it helps when you're using formalin malachite it helps to um, have a microscope to make sure that you've got the parasite cleared um, it, so in koi ponds that are kind of financially they're a little bit too large to use praziquantel you might reach for formalin malachite um, actually or potassium permanganate uh, potassium permanganate is not by any means my favorite uh, chloramine T also uh, clears flukes actually it clears flukes pretty well problem is it's uh, available in a compound called halamid at uh, very reasonable if you want to buy five pounds of halamid which will last you for the rest of your life um, also may be hazardous to have around your house but uh, it's also kind of dangerous for the fish there's some companies uh, out there lifeguard is one that has tamed the chloramine tea and put it in their lifeguard product and it works pretty well against the specific things that it's intended to work for it is not a cure-all or panacea uh, the way they're selling it but it is effective as a um, hobbyist version of chloramine tea. Uh, I hope you wrote that down. Flukes in large ponds, why don't we just gloss that over and let you read the slide, because, I mean, really, if you have a very large pond that you need to clear of flukes, you probably would be better just to get with me at the office and we'll strategize something. Uh, the econ economics of me helping you at maybe a hundred to hundred and fifty dollars for the consultation would save you back what you would spend in the chemicals because we probably would be talking about organophosphates so we've talked about the three different parasites uh, three different categories of parasites and uh, to give you a brief recap we're talking about ciliated protozoan parasites which are trick uh, trichodina chilodinella costia and ick those four parasites have a tendency to respond very well to salt and or malachite green. You can also use potassium permanganate, meh, and you can use formalin malachite green with pretty good results, especially in pond environments that are large. 
And the second category of parasites we covered was anchor worm, fish lice, and gill maggots. Those three you can see with your eyeball, and they're cleared with a insect growth regulator like Express IDI. And finally, the trematodes or flukes. You've seen those pictures of them. They are stretchy worms, and they are easy to clear with a compound called Praziquantel, which is available in Pro. Um, and other similar competing products. I mean, you, like I said, you're going to see Prozzi uh, in the name or in the ingredients list. That picture right there happens to be a Placostomus in a 20 can cooler. That thing is about 17 inches. That's what happens when you put a Placostomus in a koi pond for the summer, one year. And uh, then in the fall, when the pond hits 55 degrees, they die summarily. Uh, they can't stand it at 54. They get very lethargic between 60 and 55, but they'll live um, at 55 degrees. Enzyme systems shut down. There's no way around that. Um, and a lot of times you put your Oscar, or excuse me, you put your Placostomus in there, and there's no way to to get it out. Um, they blend in with the bottom, and uh, this has absolutely nothing to do with uh, control of parasites. Just kind of a cool fish. Um, that's it. Man, I appreciate you um, appreciate you checking out this video.